everyone um, will be started soon. Uh, I get the honor of introducing our speaker. Um, my name is Jaffet Wood. I'm the executive director of the New York Masterful. I see a lot of New York Masterful students and parents and um, uh, people from the wider New York Masterful community. Uh, our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Po Shen Lo. He's a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and he's also the lead coach of the USA International Math Olympiad team. And he's coming to us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, tonight to talk about probability. Uh, this is a repeat performance. Uh, last year we um, had him give a talk uh, about big numbers, really big numbers. Uh, if you were there, you, you know how big I'm talking about. Sometimes the greater public thinks that that's what we think about all the time as mathematicians, is big numbers. And in that case, it was true. Uh, and I'm curious, as, as you are, about what wonders about probability await us this evening. So without further ado, um, here's Dr. Po Shen Lo. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to come here. This is an amazing math circle, and I congratulate all of the organizers and teachers here for running such a wonderful event that brings together people from New York City to do math. So last time I said mathematicians, I guess, think about numbers. Well, there's actually an incredible theory in an area of math where the biggest number you can see is 1, and the smallest number you can see is 0. And this is the area of Probability. Because it's hard to define, it's hard to say, what does it mean that tomorrow the chance of rain is 300%? Maybe that's an over-enthusiastic person saying so, but that, that means nothing in mathematics. 100% is the highest probability you can have. So, just to get an idea of the audience, I can pitch this talk at any level, and I would like to know how many people in this audience are in middle school? Very good, very good. And how many of them are in high school? Okay, okay. And I, I promise you that there will be something here. I, I, basically, my goal is to make sure that even if you are in, in middle school, you're going to get some stuff out of this talk. But I also will promise you if you're in high school, that you're going to get some stuff out of this talk too. Just please be patient and don't give things away too early. So, as a warm-up, let's just talk about some basic things, just to get on the same page about probability. Here's a question. Suppose I have a bag, and the bag has some balls in it. Actually, it's very convenient that we have colors. So let's say, suppose it has two yellow balls in it and uh, three red balls. Okay, this is a warm up. Okay, don't worry, we'll do more intense stuff soon. Suppose I pick one. What is the probability that I get a yellow ball? Okay, yes? Um, two out of five. It's 2 out of 5. And why is it 2 out of 5? What's the significance of the 2? What's the significance of the 5? Yes? Um, there are two yellow balls and then 5 balls total. So okay. So you look at total. And in some sense, what you were looking at is um, this is like the total number of outcomes. Is that sort of how you're thinking of it? Like when you click in, there's like five different things you can get out. So this is like the number of outcomes. Have people seen that word before, outcomes? probability, okay? If I say this is the number of outcomes, what's the significance of the two? What kind of outcomes are those? Yeah? Yellow outcomes. Yellow outcomes. It's like the number of successful outcomes. Is that okay? Number of successful outcomes. Excellent. So this is how we usually think of probability. So let me put a little twist on this. Suppose I have a slightly different bag. In this bag, I have two yellow balls. And I have three red balls. They're pretty big. You pick one. What's the probability that you get a yellow ball? Yeah? It's still two fifths. It's still two fifths. Why do you say it's still two fifths? Uh, because there's still a total of five outcomes. Okay. So if I use this definition, there are still five outcomes. There are still two successful outcomes. So the answer should be two fifths. But you know, let me take it even to an even more limit. Okay. Suppose 
there are three mega balls, and there are two yellow balls, each is the size of a uranium atom. You reach into that bag. What's the chance you're going to get those? So this doesn't seem to be so okay. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just trying to say, like, I, I'm trying to go at the definition and say, you know, you've got to be a bit careful here. It's not quite like this. Indeed, there's something, I'm, I'm going to draw these again, which are like, supposedly half the size. I'm sort of saying they're half as likely. Does it make sense if it's bigger, you're more likely to, to grab it? Well, sort of, unless you're intentionally trying to feel for the smaller ones. Okay, so this is, this is a contrived example. I'm just trying to say, what would you do? How would you figure out the probability if what I'm telling you is inside this bag, it's not only true that some are yellow and some are red, I'm also telling you that the, uh, the red one, I'm saying that the red one, I'm telling you, like in mathematics we're making some, uh, making some assumption about here, I'm saying that the yellow ball is twice as likely as, uh, the red one is twice as likely as the yellow one, suppose. The great thing about math is everything starts with the gift. Okay, so if it is true that the red is twice as likely as the yellow, now what's the probability to get a yellow? How do you deal with this now? Yeah. Okay, you might have had an idea, but let's just keep going. Uh, oh, you got it? Did you say? No? Okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, let's go back there. Yeah. Now you're saying one fourth. But why is it one fourth? There's not four of anything. There's not one of anything. Well, you actually simplified that one fourth. <laughs> I don't want to simplify that one fourth. Can you tell me what you got before the one fourth? Two eighths. Two eighths. Okay. To be honest, it doesn't really matter whether you simplify or not. Why is it two eighths? Can someone else explain what he just did? Yeah. Because one big red ball counts as two little red balls. Okay. So what you're saying here is that the red ball counts as two of the yellow balls, right? So the way to see this is to say this problem. <coughs> actually, you could maybe. The way to formalize it, so this question is similar to, I'll write the same answer as another problem where what I'm going to draw is I'm going to draw a dartboard. Okay? If you're an advanced mathematician, you might call that a measure space, but that's not, let's not use that word. I'll call it a dartboard, okay? Here's a dartboard. As you know, in a dartboard, you have regions for getting points. Um, this is going to be a strange dartboard in the sense that the regions are easy shapes for me to draw. I don't think any dartboards are designed this way. But this is your dartboard, and it has these regions. Okay? It's not really that you get points. I'm going to say that somehow, I'm just going to draw some pictures on here. I'm going to draw a big red ball here, a big red ball here, a big red ball here, and two little yellow balls here. I just drew a picture. Can someone tell me the significance of this picture with respect to the problem? Yeah. Mega ball, that's right. So, so the mega ball is a quarter, right? So the idea is if what you were doing is if you were throwing a dart at this board, and you just see where your dart lands, and if the dart landed here, you'd say, oh, that's like picking one of those mega balls. Do you see that it would be the same between the two? Does it make sense? Like playing darts on this thing gives you the same outcome as picking one thing out of here under the assumption that the red is twice as likely as the yellow. Okay? So this one is playing darts. <coughs> and you ask for the probability that you hit one of these things. And then from here, it's now easy to see that if this thing was, if each area of this is twice the area of this, for example, if the area of the yellow was x, and the area of the red is therefore 2x, can you tell me what x is? How do I find out what x is at the end? Yeah. 1 8 because 2x plus 2x plus 2x plus x plus x has to be 1, right? So I get x is 1 8. Okay, this was a warm up. Let's get slightly more sophisticated. So throughout the talk, we'll get more and more sophisticated from like, so that everyone will, will see something. Uh, good. So this, this was just to show you know, you've got to be careful about equally likely outcomes if you have a definition that says it's just number of successful over number of outcomes. That definition is good only when every outcome is equally likely. Let me go into a different direction. It actually it, it carries the word of statistics. So I had a, I had a friend uh, who's a very successful mathematician now. And he, he commented that how he really got into math was when he was a kid, he really loved following baseball statistics. And he, he, he's, now, he's, now, he's now a professor. Are there any of you who are like really, really keen on baseball statistics? I'm just curious. That's you? Yeah? OK. Good. OK. So what's like the key baseball stat? If you look at a player. What is their key stat? Um, well, with batting average and 
Okay, so you just said the word batting average. And since I actually don't know anything about baseball, <laughs> let's make sure, I mean, so, that, so don't worry, if you don't know, I don't know either. So let's, let's like define batting average. You said batting average, I like how you said in a given year, because usually they don't talk about their lifetime batting average, including little league. So, so batting average in a uh, year. Do they play all year, actually, or do they play a season? I actually don't know the answer to this question. What's that? Only parts of the year. Let me call it a season. Okay? This is some fraction. Alright? What is the fraction? What's on top, what's on the bottom? And I want to do this so that even if you don't know baseball, you will know this and then we can talk about it. Okay? What's the, what's the bottom of this thing? Yeah? I'm assuming it's going to be how many balls you hit or how many balls you are throwing. Yeah, I think that's roughly right. Let me call it that. That'll be easy enough to understand. This is the number of hits in the season over, I'll call it the number of... At-bats. Number of... At what? At-bats. At-bats is, is correct. It's just that people who don't know baseball might not know what at-bats means, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say number of um, potential hits. Is that okay? Number of times... Well, that's not such a strange word. Number of opportunities. Can I use that? Yeah. Number of opportunities. in that same season, okay? And this is like your key stat. Why is it your key stat? What do you do if you've got like a, if you compare, like, oh, why, why is this important? Yeah? The higher is the, basically like the better you are. So what you said is that the higher it is, the better you are. And there's a reason why this is like a, a reasonable philosophy. I mean, this is what happened in the past. That was last season, right? But why is this like a reasonable estimate? Yeah? Well, uh, yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah. Uh, it, have it, could, it could be a good way of showing how they might do this season. Right. So people often think of this as like a rough estimate of the probability that they will hit the ball the next time the ball is thrown at them. Okay? I'm just emphasizing this is not a probability in the sense that I'm not, I'm not drawing something from somewhere. This is what already happened. This is like a statistic. But don't worry too much about that. Fine here. Okay, so this is what we have here. So let's, let's do another warm-up question. Let's suppose we have two baseball players. Say you have two players. Um, let's call the two players Adam and Bob. Mathematicians like to choose names that start with A, B, C, D, because then you can keep track of them more easily. And it's just fortunate that most theorems don't require more than 26 people. So we have Adam and Bob. And uh, let's suppose we know some stuff about Adam and Bob. You know, this is their batting average in the season, but you can also figure out their batting average over half a season, right? You just like look at how many opportunities they had in the first half of the season and how many hits they had in the first half of the season. You could do this. So let's suppose that we know and um, in first half of the season, <coughs> Adam's batting average is better than Bob's. And again, let me define this very carefully. What I mean is that if you look over the first half of the season and you see how many times Adam got to hit, and how many he actually hit, that's his fraction, batting average first half of the season. You can do the same thing for Bob's first half of the season, and Adam's better than Bob. And we also know one more thing. In the second half of the season, the same thing is true. All right, so these guys decided that they didn't want to do batting average by the whole season. They're really competitive. Every half season, they check their batting average and compare it, and Adam's better than Bob. So here's a question. How does Adam's full season batting average, meaning that you just like combine over the whole season, compare to Bob's? Yes? Adam's batting average is more than Bob's. You're saying Adam's better. Well, I feel very sorry. You're amazing that you can read that. But, um, I, yeah, I'll do my best to try to write big so you can see. So you're saying Adam is better than Bob in the first half. Adam is better than Bob in the second half. Therefore, Adam is better than Bob. Okay, uh, any, any other thoughts? Yeah? That's not necessarily true because... What? It's not true. Because uh, in the second half, they uh, might have had less of a difference during the first half, and then when you add up the number of this and the number of opportunities, it might actually uh, Bob's. Are you 
sure? Okay. So now there's some controversy here. Okay? This is actually kind of interesting. I wrote something for which the obvious answer is that Adams is better than Bob. By the way, you should be extremely suspicious whenever there's some talk with the title about paradoxes and something is written down and there's like some obvious answer. And then especially if there's some controversy that starts to arise from the crowd. So I'll say, don't worry, what you gave is what you would expect to be the case. Okay? And the first time I saw this, I was also like, of course it's better. But it's actually not. And that's the first thing I want to talk about today. And especially for the parents, like this is like a public service announcement. If you, if, if you see statements like this, these don't imply that. And this is actually a good thing for the public to know about. Okay? So now let's start talking about Google. No, seriously, because if you're looking at, say, medical studies, or you're looking at polls, this is telling you that just because things match on partition data, it doesn't necessarily match in the aggregate. And it's, it's, it's uh, counterintuitive. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to show an example of why, of how this could break. And you made your hand up for a long time. Okay. Yes, what did you want to say? If under ridiculous circumstances in both seasons, both Adam and Bob only bat once. OK, so first, 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 let me start to write this so that everyone can follow what is saying, but what was being said. The answer to this question is, it depends. Sometimes Adam is better than Bob. I mean, you can imagine that. If they just do exactly the same thing both seasons, then Adam's full batting average will be exactly the same as his first batting average. So it could be that Adam's is better than Bob. But the answer is that Bob could be better. And whenever you want to show an answer like this, you need to construct an example. You're going to construct a ridiculous looking example, but that's OK. The ridiculous looking example is illustrated. So for example, we could have, let me draw a chart. Here's Adam's. Here's Adam's performance. Here's Bob's performance. Here's the first half. Here's the second half. And here is the total. Does this make sense? I'm going to write some numbers here. So that's what you want to say. So you said something ridiculous where only one. Keep going. So in the first half. Both of them only bat once. So you're saying in the first half they are both what the, the position in baseball is called bench warmer, right? So so they both uh, is that right? Is that is that correct? I actually don't know baseball, I think so. Maybe. Okay, so so, so both both try wide. Alright. Wait, now you don't have much flexibility. If Adam is supposed to be better than Bob in the first half, can someone else tell me how you must fill this in? Yeah. Well Adam loves one, Adam one, and Bob loves zero. Alright. So what you're saying is we're, we're making an example. Let's see how this one goes. So far, this agrees with the hypothesis. All right. How about the second? How do you want to show the second half? Yeah. Um, well, you could have them both bat two times instead. So Adam um, could bat zero, could have um, beat um, zero out of two times, and Bob two out of three times. Ah. So there's a slight issue. So there's a slight issue here. There's a reason why I'm not allowed to do this. Okay, and the reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it, all, it says in the second half, Adam also was better than Bob. Right? I, I'm trying to say that, by the way, this example is not totally easy to come up with. That's why I've been counterintuitive for people that it's even possible this way. But the problem with this is <coughs> zero is actually less than one. I need it to go the other way. Oh, I thought you meant I'm trying to even possible. It's possible. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So what I mean is that Bob could be better even though Adams is better than Bob in both of the halves. So I want an example that will do that for me. This one won't quite do it. Let's try again. That's OK. In math, actually, the important part is to be wrong enough times, because after a while, you're right. Okay? Because you've learned something. Basically, as you're wrong, you learn that, oh, that doesn't work. It's like you learn there are 999 things that don't work, and then eventually you find one that does. So go on. Your, your idea. more ridiculous. I'm going to give it a thousand, okay? That's fine. But where, where do you want, I see where you're going. If you wrote one here, can someone else tell me what she has to write there? She has no choice. She has to write one there. She can write any number less than 1,000. Sounds good. What number would you like to choose? Um, 999. Yes, these are superstar <laughs> baseball players. <laughs> okay, very good. Second half. Now, how can I fill the second half? Maybe, so you're on track. This is correct. Uh, no, not that it's correct. There are many ways to do this, but you're on the track of something. Can someone help finish it with the second half? 
we see the deal here is that somehow, yeah, Adam's better than Bob, but Bob got a lot of tries. Yeah? Well, um, Adam could have had two tries. How about a thousand? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Bob has how many? Um, maybe a thousand. Yeah. One. one. Yeah. I heard number one, okay? How can I complete this? Well, I can tell you what you've got right there. It's uh, <coughs> zero. Is that what zero is what you were going to say? Because this is supposed to be bigger than that. And what can I write here? One. <laughs> All right. So, Adam is better than Bob. Adam is also better than Bob. Grand total. So now this is, by the way, how you do not add fractions. But if you want to combine these two, if you want to combine these two, the way to combine them is what is the denominator? You add the two denominators, okay? And what's the numerator? Okay. And on the other side, and this guy is okay. So what we have come up with is even though Adam is better than Bob in the first half, and Adam is better than Bob in the second half, Adam cannot play baseball at all. <laughs> He's the best baseball player that ever like could have you could ever imagine. Is this is this a surprise? Wow. Yes, wow, wow is important. There's a name for this thing. If you're curious about this later, you can look up Simpson Paradox. If you don't have to look it up now, you can look it up later. You can find out more about this. But it's important to know that such things can exist. Because then, even though your brain, your, your intuition told you that this and this imply that, it's really not the case. Yeah? I get it. was kind of like two levels. Like, if you have one half, you're going to check getting this. Yeah, so I would say you could, when you, when you do these combining things, you might, it might be a similar set of things. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, thank you. I mean, these, these, these examples are quite great. Something else I should say, by the way, maybe why your brain thought that if this is bigger than this and this is bigger than this, then this should be bigger than this. Maybe why your brain thought that is related to the fact that if really these were fractions, and if you just added the fractions to get this one, it then would be true. The reason this is not giving you what you expect is because this is not how you normally add fractions. Is that okay? Because if I have two fractions, A and B, where A is bigger than B, two fractions, C and D, where C is bigger than D, then if I take just normal A plus C and normal B plus D, that really does compare the right way. Is that okay? But this is just the wrong way to add fractions. It's the right way to add value everything. Very good. Let's go on to another time. So, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about requires um, actually everyone to have some sort of way to write stuff down. You're not going to do much math, or maybe not even any. But if you have, if everyone can have a piece of paper or a scrap of paper and some writing utensil, that would be great. You can just use like a tiny strip of paper. You can even borrow the pencil after the person next to you has used it. Um, and, and, and parents and kids, everyone is welcome to play this. And I need two volunteers. Oh, okay. So you have your hand really fast. Yeah, come on up. You're up. Is I want you to write the numbers should be numbers between zero and one, and they should be different. I actually mean not just integers. You can write fractions, you can write uh, real numbers or whatever. And you should be able to compute them approximately, okay? So don't write like some completely ridiculous expressions. All right? So everyone write down two numbers, one on the left, one on the right. The rules are they have to be different, and they have to be between zero and one in Charlotte, you two. Okay? But my, we're, we're not going to look at what Charlotte, right? It's okay if you see what I'm looking for. Right? All right? So everyone do this. Okay? <coughs> Two numbers, one on the left, one on the right. Very good. Okay, so now don't show that to her. Don't show that to Maya. You can take a picture. You can just take a picture. Yeah, okay. All right. So now let me explain how this game works. So Maya is supposed to guess which number is bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right. Uh, she's going to guess for Charlotte, which is bigger, the left one or the right one. Before you guess, let's, th let's start to think about this together. What's the best strategy for Maya? Do you want to answer? Do you want to answer? I'll answer. It's entirely up to you. Don't guess yet. I just want to get. I want to get something. So, what would you do if you, if, you were, if you were trying to win? You were trying to be right. And don't tell her whether she's right or wrong. 
what, what would you do? What, what sort of, what, what, what do you think about, what do you think is your best, what's your best strategy, what's your best chance of winning? You're welcome to, to, to call on the crowd too if you want to have ideas. Yeah, you can call on the crowd. <laughs> So Charlotte wrote two different numbers. They were already written. Maya is supposed to guess left one or right one, saying which one's bigger. What should she do? You can call on multiples. Yeah, well, because the answer So uh, the answer that he said is that it's 50-50, good chance either way, so just pick one side. OK, that's a, that's a legitimate idea. Does anyone else have an idea? Don't worry, I think we can put that spot. Yeah, uh-huh. Psychologically. Since numbers usually start on the left smaller and then go up one, two, three, four, five to the right bigger, if you have to write down really quickly, I'm going to assume that your first thought would be to write the smaller number on the left. Very good. And so suppose you're a scientist. We have something, oh, you are a scientist, excellent. So there's something that already <laughs> happened that if Maya could ask the whole crowd stuff, what, what might be a good idea? You're, you're welcome to Oh man, so what he's saying is that when you write numbers between 0 and 1, those denominators are the things that are growing. But what I'm trying to say is there's something you can do to edit me to guess. Okay, I'll, I'll try to help. Oh, there, there are things you can do, especially given the setup of how I even started this whole thing, that give you actually an edge over 50-50. You have an edge over 50-50. Did you write the bigger one on the left or the right? I don't know. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah, and does this sort of make sense? Do you want to try that? Let's try that. And again, I should say, we're not putting you on the spot. You might be wrong, but I'll also talk about later why that's actually a very good strategy. Why don't we try that? Um, okay, uh, how many people had written the bigger one on the left? Um, how many people uh, had written the bigger one on the right? Are other people looking around to get an idea of what's going on here? <laughs> okay. So, so you don't, even without counting, what did you notice? Uh, I felt like more people wrote the bigger one on the right. Yeah, did other people notice that too? Yeah. And was it just like winning by one? No. It was like pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So what would be a good guess then? I feel like the bigger one would be on the right. Yeah. Except, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was not a setup. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Let's, let's, yeah, so, it takes a lot of guts to be a volunteer. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, now I didn't mean to put you on the spot. In fact, actually, what I'll say is that indeed, when you do this experiment, sometimes you, you're wrong. But let's even think this way. Can someone guess like what fraction of people were they on the right given what you saw in this room? What, what, what ballpark would you say? What did it look like to you? Like six tenths? Actually, to me it looked even more than that. But like let's say two thirds, one third. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. So suppose it really was two thirds, one third. That that was the general population of New York math circle. That two thirds, one third will write it on the right. Remember when I asked for volunteers, I just kind of picked random people. In fact, Charlotte was like a random person chosen to, uh, that's not completely true, it's biased by the fact that she volunteered. But pretend it was, if it was really random, then with what probability would Maya have been correct? If it's true that in this room, two thirds of you wrote the bigger number on the right, and if I would choose a random one of you to come here, and the algorithm would be to pull the crowd and to go by majority, what chance do you have of winning? And it's two-thirds? It's very close to two-thirds. Does this make sense? Because when you pull the crowd, no matter who I pulled out, you would have seen the majority is that it's on the right. So whoever, if you follow that method, you'd have always guessed the right, right, in this, in this room. And when I choose a random person, what's the chance that I chose a random person for which it is on the right? It's two-thirds. 
Does that make sense? So what I'm trying to say is that this was not actually a setup. Maya, the odds were in your favor. You, you had like a, a two-thirds chance of being correct here. It just so happens that Charlotte is in the uh, different thinkers category, which is good. So OK, good. So now we know how this game works. But wait, now the cat's out of the bag. Suppose we wanted to play it again. Don't worry, you don't have to get up again. But suppose, again, Charlotte and Maya were going to play, but we've had this conversation. So now, when Maya's writing the numbers, she knows that Charlotte, I'm oh, sorry, when, when Charlotte's writing the numbers, she knows that Maya knows that she knows that Maya knows that she knows that Maya knows that the crowd knows that the, the, the bias is two-thirds, one-third when they're not thinking. And therefore, what will Maya do? Well, it depends how many times you do this in your head, right? Which is the other option? <laughs> okay, we've just had this conversation. Now what's she going to do? <laughs> so, yeah? She put it on the right. She put it on the right. Oh, but we just said that. So now what will she do? So what I'm trying to say by this is that once you've had this conversation, Suddenly, the psychological factor is uh, somehow squished out. Although maybe you could do some human statistics and see even after the conversation what happens. But my guess is that after this conversation, if I ask everyone to write down numbers and then we pull the crowd, the proportion would not be two thirds, one third anymore. My guess is that it would be basically very close to fifty fifty. Do people agree with this? Because now everyone is trying to psych out everyone else, going different <laughs> different levels of depth. Okay. So yeah.
with 50% probability. Does this sort of make sense? 50% is not bad. At least you'll win half the time. It's better than losing more than half the time. And I want to make this even more precise. I'm going to write a statement that says this. I mean, it's going to look like uh, some, not really, there's some words from theoretical math. What I'm going to say is that for any strategy, Charlotte uses, if Maya does this, uh, so for any strategy that Charlotte uses, if Maya flips the coin to decide, then I'm going to write it in a certain order. Then, after Charlotte wrote her numbers, Maya's probability of winning is exactly 50%. Does this sentence make sense to people? It should look almost like legalese because I'm being very careful to say what happens when. You had a hand up. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think that's true. You don't think that's true? Yeah, because regardless of the fact that um, there's a 50% chance that she'll get um, edge of tails on the coin, there might be a greater chance of like figuring out which number is bigger after. <laughs> Ah, so I'm not saying that this is the best strategy yet. That's not what I'm claiming. I mean, you're saying that maybe the best strategy is just read the mind. <laughs> I mean, you can do this now, right? You can use these like uh, brainwave readers. So, so there are better strategies in the modern age. There's an app for that. What's that? There's an app for that. There's an app for that. <laughs> Amazing. Is the app called Put a Mirror Behind the Other Person? <laughs> okay, very good. So I didn't say it's the best strategy that Maya has. In fact, if we had more time, we could prove this was. But what this is saying is that if Maya uses this strategy, point flipping, then even if she plays it with Charlotte, or she plays it with someone else, or she plays it with someone else, no matter who she plays with, her chance is always exactly half. And the reason why is because look what I wrote. I wrote after Charlotte wrote her numbers. So there's this word probability. Oftentimes, the, the, the difficult part with probability is what's the randomness? And indeed, over here, when I write this statement, after Charlotte wrote her numbers, there are now two numbers written on a piece of paper, just like how you saw it being done. Charlotte had two numbers written down. And then at that point, if, if, if Maya is going to flip a coin, then her chance of winning is exactly 50%, no matter what Charlotte wrote down. Do people believe this? This is a very powerful statement. It says, no matter what Charlotte wrote down, at that point, at that moment, when Charlotte has her numbers down, Maya can win with probability 50%. I don't have the time in this lecture to show, but you can actually prove that there is no strategy for Maya that is better than this in the sense of being able to beat every strategy Charlotte uses. For those of you who are more mathematicians, this is basically putting a, a for all quantifier in front of the entire sentence. And this, by, by saying for all strategies, this is like game theory, you're saying there's no, uh, you, you can beat every single strategy using this method with probability 50%, okay? Good. The reason I'm emphasizing this is I want to make the game slightly more complex. So now suppose what happens is that Charlotte writes two numbers. And Maya is supposed to guess which is bigger. Okay, But there's some space. That's because they're going to have a conversation. Maya is going to ask Charlotte which is bigger. Well, no, no, that's not quite right. That would be too much. Uh, well, unless Maya is allowed to, unless Charlotte is allowed to lie, but let's not do that. So what I'll say is that you know, everyone's going to be truthful here. Maya can point to either the left one or the right one. She can't see that. She just either points to the left or the right one. Okay? Maya uh, points to the left or the right. And then Charlotte is actually going to be truthful. Charlotte's going to tell exactly what number that is. 
Okay, remember Charlotte has two numbers here. There are two numbers here. Maya is pointed to one, and Charlotte says, oh yeah, it's this one. Okay? So Charlotte tells that number. Then Maya gets does this setup make sense to people? Mm -hmm. You could imagine playing this, you know, you wrote down the two numbers, and then Maya is like, hmm, I want to know what the one is on the right. You know, and then Charlotte says, oh yes, the one on the right here is like, oh actually that's right, and that's not mixed up, but don't worry. The one over here is 0.44, right? I think something like that. And then Maya says, oh, that's right. thank you. And then now I'm going to guess the other one. Basically, Maya gets to decide whether to stick with her guess that that one is the bigger one, or she gets to switch. This might sound like something else you may have heard of before. Yeah? Yeah, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> I don't want to talk about something you have already heard about, so I'm not talking about the Monty Hall paradox, except that I am talking about the Monty Hall paradox to tell you, if you like this stuff, search uh, later and read about a completely different paradox called the... Yeah, oh, call the Monty Hall paradox. Okay? But we, don't, we don't have that much time. So, so let's, let's go. So, uh, Right. What can we do here? What 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 should what should what should I do? Yeah. You know, this was even because you at um in general for all strategies, um the coin is the only one that has the um coin. This nice this nice guarantee. Yeah, it's the only one guaranteed to be one half. But since it's not all strategy that people would like to be used, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best strategy. Okay. So, yes, it's more complex than saying, point. It's like, is it almost called? Does Charlotte know that Maya's going to get to do this? Oh, yeah, yeah. At this point, everything's out of the bag. We can see everything now. So, but let me emphasize one thing that was just said. One thing that was just said is that the flip a coin strategy on this game still gets the probability of winning of exactly half. So, you, you, you won't go worse than half uh, guaranteed winning probability. You could just put the coin. She could just always point to the left number and then close her ears and then just say, okay, now I put my coin and that, like, that, that left is right is bigger. You know, she, she can do that, right? So she can, with this coin flip strategy, she can guarantee that she's in a situation where the probability of winning is exactly half. And of course the question is, as greedy people, can we get a better probability than half? And there was another thing that I want to emphasize that you said, which is you were asking, does Maya know this whole setup, and the answer, oh, sorry, does Charlotte know the whole setup? And yes, Charlotte does know that this is going to happen. So Charlotte is able to mind game as much as she wants. Okay? And then the question is, if, if Charlotte gets to mind game as much as she wants, that's this third sentence, does Maya have a better way of playing than this one? Okay, now let's gather some more ideas. There was something else down here. Yeah? Well, the number that you hear is like larger than 0.5, then so the idea that was just said is that, hey, here's a strategy for Maya. The strategy for Maya is that, first, how will she decide whether to ask left or right? Do you have a proposal? How will she choose the first thing she has to ask, like left or right? What should she do? You, you give me the whole strategy. You, you, have, you have the second half, which is good. What's the first half? <laughs> ah, so, so the first one, she's going to flip a coin, and with half chance she'll say, tell me the one on the left. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. So first, she flips the coin, and then says, either left, or says to show me the left, or show me the right. Okay. Now, after she does this, Charlotte tells her a number, and what you're saying is if, if the number you said is, I'll just start bigger equal will be close enough. Is that okay? Probably, I just think I have it all the way. Bigger, well, actually, no, I can do that. You can use the bigger. Bigger than half, then what should Maya do? Stick with it. Right? Say, like, that's the bigger one. You know, stick, stick with the choice. Then Maya. Uh, guesses that that one's bigger. So sticks with it, right? Else, Maya switches. Does switches make sense? Switches means I think the other one's bigger. So the, this is a strategy. Maya can do this. 
let's analyze how good this strategy is. Remember that Charlotte can do anything. Yeah. Um, maybe um, my Maya didn't have a point. She could use paper instead, right? Yes, no, and then tumble them up and like just choose. Them. Ah, so you said she could ask people. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you could do that too, but then sometimes when you play this, there are not other people. I'd like to get a little bit into the how good is this strategy. I mean, you know, this strategy has a nice statement. It says, for any strategy Charlotte uses, if Maya does her thing, then after Charlotte wrote her numbers, there's some possibility of winning. So I want to talk about this one. Yeah. So I think if, my, if um, Charlotte knows about this, yeah. it's not a little bad. It's not a very good strategy. Because um, if she knows about that, then Charlotte is obviously going to write either both of them less than 0.5 or both of them more than 0.5. Okay, let's go with the first thing that you said. I'm just going to write this down. But then, what if Charlotte writes, I'm just going to give uh, a very simple strategy for Charlotte, writes uh, 0.44 and 0.12. I forgot what you wrote. Okay, suppose this is a strategy that Charlotte can use. Notice the sentence starts this way. For any strategy Charlotte uses. This is a strategy. The strategy is called every single time write those numbers. <laughs> you could do this. This is a strategy, right? <laughs> then, suppose Maya uses her strategy. So, Charlotte wrote this. This is the Charlotte strategy. Do you notice how I'm, doing, how I'm analyzing this sentence? I'm trying to emphasize that in math, these four any's are extremely strong. So, for any, this is an any. This is one, right? This is one possibility. Maybe Charlotte did this. Then, if Maya this thing here is the strategy. Suppose Maya does that thing. What's Maya's chance of winning on that strategy? What's going to happen? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think um, that strategy is that good because, um, uh, because then it's kind of 50-50 whether she gets it because yes. 0.42 and 0.11 are both are less both than under good. 45, so it could go either way. Yes. So what's going to happen here is that Maya, what's going to happen? Is she always going to, uh, for quite, tell me that one. And oh, it's less than half. So I'll switch. Does that make sense? That Maya always switches. And if she's always going to switch, then her chance of being right is exactly if she was wrong the first time. Does that make sense? So Maya wins. Uh, exactly when <coughs> wrong the first time. And that means that the probability that Maya wins is exactly equal to one half if this is what Charlotte is doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And notice the way I'm saying here is that the great thing about the coin flip is I always guarantee uh, a half, actually at least a half. And so far, this strategy here is not giving me a better guarantee than half. As a greedy person, I wish I could write down something saying, for any strategy Charlotte uses, if Maya, what a secret strategy, then after Charlotte wrote her numbers, Maya's probability winning is at least 0 0.7. That would be great, right? Can I do that? Yeah. Um, that would also be very unlikely strategy. It's very unlikely strategy Charlotte. You're right. If you're in like the Charlotte strategy, it's going to be by 4.42 right. and then 0.11. So when you consider that, it's, I mean, how much time is Charlotte given to think before she writes the number? Um, well, <laughs> see, this, she's given nope. like an hour, 30 minutes, she has to write them in five seconds. She has to write them in five seconds, that's a good strategy. Right. She has time to think, it's a pretty crappy strategy. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's almost always going to do something like um, two thirds and 850 over 900. So one thing I'm going to say is that because the sentence starts with for any strategy, Charlotte is even allowed to think for 10,000 years. <laughs> what, what this means is that I, wa I want to have a strategy for Maya that she can deploy against every Charlotte that ever was around, you know, who ever thought for as long as she wanted. It would always give a good probability win, right? So, so although you were talking about the likelihood, the typical Charlotte, uh, this statement is about every Charlotte. That's what I want to emphasize here. In the math, when I write it for any, it's really strong. It includes unlikely strategies. Yeah, but if you go with the probability strategy you use, 
Yes. 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 So, so what you're saying is that if I was to actually go and play this and I want to win this, uh, I should take advantage of the fact that typical strategy is a certain thing. And indeed, when I have more time, I do play this, and you will notice that you can win with a lot more than half probability. But for this one, I want to I want to say the fact. There's a fact here that I want to share. It's a very surprising fact. So um, yeah, maybe let's put this fact here. For, and and I'm, I'm thinking about the new game, by the way. If Maya. There's a secret here, a secret strategy, which I'm going to tell you, special strategy. If she does this, then after Charlotte broke her numbers, Maya's probability of winning is bigger than half. This should be hopefully counterintuitive to quite a few people, because this includes weird strategies. And that's why I wanted to dwell on this for a while to show you that it's hard. But some thoughts, yeah? Okay, what if Charlotte gets Um, in that case, in that case, the best thing might indeed be a random guess. I'll have to think about that a bit more. So okay. I'll have to think about that a bit more because this, this, that's a different setup. That's a different setup. It's a different game. Okay. okay? That might have a quick answer. Let's talk right after it. So does this statement, like do the, do the words in the statement make sense? This is a very amazing strategy that says that even if she plays against the Charlotte who has superhuman powers in, 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 in setting down some strategies, Maya will actually have a bigger than half chance of winning. And if you notice from here, it's not easy to construct that strategy. Like we did this, we tried, but it didn't work. But what else could we try? What else in the world could I do? I mean, that seems very reasonable. Should I just change that to bigger than 0.7? Does that sound like a good idea? That sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, you're not allowed to see both of them. <laughs> Otherwise, you can win with probability 100%. So let me just share this strategy. I, I, sometimes I, I realize that we're getting late on time, so let me just let me share this because this is also surprising. So the answer is actually similar to what you said. The answer is that in order to beat a half, Maya should flip another coin. <coughs> now that seems strange. Maya should use some more randomness. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what the special strategy is. <coughs> This is the special strategy in that box. Well, first what Maya does is that she does flip this coin to decide left or right. And then you get to ask left or right. So you get to see a number. Maybe I'll call the number like a number in a circle. This is what you see. Then the next step is a bit straight. Now what Maya does is she goes and makes her own number. She makes her own random number between 0 and 1. Okay. Maya takes her own random number uh, between 0 and 1. And when I say pick a random number, I'm referring to something called a uniform distribution. That doesn't exactly mean that everyone is equally likely. Indeed, they are all equally likely. The probability that you pick each one is actually zero. But this is along the uniform distribution, where the, it's spread evenly. The only random number, uniformly. And she calls it x. OK. And then now, she's going to use x to uh, guess left or right being bigger. If the number that she heard is bigger than <coughs> x, maybe I'll write this, yeah, bigger than x, then stick. It should look very similar to what's going on here. It's just that instead of 0.5, she uses a random threshold. Does that make sense? This is a, this is a deterministic threshold, always 0.5. And we already analyzed in the deterministic threshold, she can only guarantee the chance of winning to be at least half. But over here, she uses a random threshold. And this should also be counterintuitive. How could adding more random noise help you? Well, it does. You have a question. Couldn't you use a number before you hear the number so that you have like what you think and affected by what you hear? Uh, yes. Uh, well, actually, it doesn't matter. You could also make yourself not affected. But I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that, OK? So let's just do what you said. 
This is the exact same strategy as first picking the number. Is that okay? If you, if you promise not to be affected by what you heard. And indeed, let's put that all the way up there. I, I actually like it better that way. But it's really clear you're not going to be affected by what you heard. This is here. Then she flips a coin out left and right, and then follows this. And then else, else is if the number that she heard is smaller than x, then she switches. Why does this work? Your intuition might even tell you this should be worse. Okay? Because what, 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 what if the x was 0.1? Then I would stick. You know what I mean? Like, you can't be 0.1. Let's analyze this and then we'll be done. So let me diagram this. And that's why I wrote it this way. For any strategy Charlotte uses, okay, if Maya does that, so we know what Maya is going to do, then the key says, after Charlotte wrote her numbers, so there are numbers written down now. So Charlotte has two numbers written down. Okay, I'll diagram that by drawing a number line. When I want to analyze this, here's a number line, 0 and 1. And Charlotte already wrote down two numbers. Is this okay? There are two numbers. I have wrote them down on the paper, but I'm going to mark them here. So Charlotte wrote down two numbers, all right? This has been written, because we're saying for any strategy, so suppose this is the strategy, and now Maya's going to do this. After Charlotte wrote the numbers, now Maya's strategy starts. What's the first thing that Maya does? Yeah. I'll write a number in the table. X. She's going to get an X, right? So she's going to make an X. Let's look at a few cases. What if Maya's X is here, OK? Because at this point, these already are written. Notice how it says after she wrote her numbers. Now there's some probability going on. The probability is where does x go? OK, the probability is where does x go? And also whether uh, Maya says left or right at the beginning. Suppose x landed here. Can you tell me what Maya is going to do here? For sure. Yeah. So what you're saying is, if x is here, Maya always stays stick. Does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. Because these are the numbers. It doesn't actually matter which one she heard. They are both bigger than x. Is this OK? Mm -hmm. She's always going to say stick. Well, if that's going to happen, if she's always going to say stick with one more randomness, the other randomness is whether she picks left or right. Can someone tell me? That if x is here, what's Maya's chance of winning? Given the like, condition of x being here, it is? 0%. 0%? I don't completely agree with 0%. She's always going to stick. It's going to be half. Because she had half chance of asking that one. She will always stick. Does this make sense? When x is here, she always sticks. And since she always sticks, she will win if she happened to guess that one. But she has 50-50 of guessing that one. So I'm going to write here that her win probability is equal to half. That's true here. How about here? If x is here, can I do a similar thing? What would she always do? She's always going to switch, because she's always going to be bigger than the x no matter what. Then she always switches. So the winning probability here is equal to half. Okay, the last part. The last part is the essential part. Suppose I have this. And suppose x landed in the middle. How do I analyze this one? So let's do it one of the things here. Uh, if it's lower, it's and higher, it's OK. So mine is going to get one of these two numbers, right? So I've got two cases. Case one, uh, Maya hears. Let me call this one 1. And let me call this one 2. Here's 1. How does 1 compare to her x? Smaller. So if, her num if the number she hears is smaller than the x, then what should she do? Then she switches. And uh, is that good? Yeah. <coughs> then she's correct. Case 2. Suppose Maya hears the number 2. I mean that one. Then what does she do? It's bigger. She sticks. 
And then uh, what happens there? Well, that's not one half. So if x is in the middle, your win probability <coughs> is equal to 1. What does this mean about your winning probability, about Maya's winning probability over R? Yeah. Right. Oh, did you have to Yeah. It's bigger than 50%. And how much? Suppose I tell you that this distance is D. Right? These are real numbers between 0 and 1. Can you tell me exactly the probability that Maya wins? That's the last thing. Probability that Maya wins, depending on the D, is equal to other calculators. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Ah, so this is what I was saying earlier about when you pick a random real number between 0 and 1, the probability that yeah, you pick one is 0. It's, it's actually not even, well, it's random. Right, it's you know zero. actually choose a random number, you probably have to eliminate something like um, 10 digits or something, but... So, yeah, so what we're saying is pretend you could actually generate a random real number all the way through. So uh, I think you might actually be able to tweak this a little bit to handle the equal cases, but it's easier just to say you're picking a random real number which has no probability of landing down. But let's work out this last thing. So what's the chance? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 66, well, I'll call it in terms of D. This is D. Maybe behind you. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. One plus D over two. Okay, slow down. <laughs> How did you get that? You're right. How did you get that? This D is the distance. D is the distance. Right. So you have D times one. D chance of landing there, and then you've got a one chance of winning. Plus one minus D of being outside, times the chance of winning outside is? And if you add these two together, you get 1 plus d over 2. And the two numbers were different. So this is actually bigger than 1 half. So this is a strategy that actually if you use, you will win with probability strictly bigger than half. If you play against a really sophisticated opponent, it won't be much more than half. But if you play this against a, a random room, and if the typical person in the random room puts d to be 1 half, if you ask like for two random numbers, if it's typically 1 half, your chance of winning is actually 3 quarters. <coughs> so if you play this in like your high school or something, or, or, or among uh, other friends, you will rack up a rather enormous uh, advantage on a game, which looks like it should be hard to beat 1 half. So, okay, well, these are what I wanted to share with you guys today. This is actually pretty, this is a pretty advanced, uh, pretty, pretty sophisticated and exciting <coughs> right here that you can beat 1 half. So thanks for coming. I'll take more questions afterwards. Yeah.